Unit 1, Day 1, Notes on Integers, Absolute Value, and Properties. Okay, so first off, integers, what are they? They are positive and negative whole numbers. That's it. Okay, so we often use the, the number line okay, to identify where those are, how to order them. So first off, we are going to have to label 0. All right, so that's easy enough. Generally, we put 0 in the middle, but it really doesn't matter where it is. Okay, as long as negatives are to the, negatives are to the left, positive numbers to the right. Okay, so next label the side that contains the negative integers as negative. Okay, so I'm going to put a big minus sign over here and label that negative. Okay. Label the side that contains the positive integers as positive. Okay, so I'm going to put a big plus over here and for positive and label it positive. Next, place 3, 3.5, and 4 on the number line. Okay, so to do that, first I'm going to label these. Okay, I'm going to space these out. I've got 1, 2, 3, and hopefully they're even, but maybe not. 4 and 5. Okay, so I'm going to place these down. So I'm going to take a different color and put a dot where 3 is. Okay, I'm placing a point where 3 is. Then 3.5 and 4, I'm going to go ahead and put 4 first. Now 3.5 is going to be three and a half, which is between three and four. So three and a half, and probably should label this as 3.5. Okay. Next, we need to place negative three, negative 3.5, and negative four. So again, I'm going to label these negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. I'm taking a different color. Let's see if I can use purple, maybe. Okay, I'm going to put a point where negative 3 is, a point where negative 4 is, and then negative 3.5 is between negative 3 and negative 4, so right here. Okay, so negative 3.5. Okay, and that's all we really need to know about integers for now, is the number line and how they're ordered. Okay, next we have absolute value. Okay, next thing on our list, absolute value. The absolute value of a number is its distance from zero. How far is it from zero? Okay, so I'm going to come back to this little picture right here. But notice the absolute value symbol is these two vertical bars that are outside of that number, okay, that surround the number. Okay, the absolute value is always positive because it's distance. Okay, so even if you're finding the absolute value of a negative number. So let's look at a couple of examples here. Now, one thing I want to point out, we're going to use algebra is big, and that's what we're, that's what the class we're doing. Um, algebra really is this where we, we are taking these variables, these letters, and we're going to treat them like a number because really they represent a number. Okay, so we're going to do a solid example of this. The absolute value of 4, A is 4, okay, how far is it from 0? Well, if you count this, 1, 2, 3, 4, it's 4 away, so that is its distance. Okay, so that is the distance from zero. Okay, distance from zero. That's all that the absolute value is. It's four away. Now negative five, okay, is one, two, three, four, five. It's five away from zero, therefore the absolute value of negative five is five. Okay, so with this next bit, okay, for the following, write a numerical representation, the opposite, okay, so the opposite means if it's positive, make it negative, if it's negative, make it positive, that's all the opposite is, the absolute value, that is always positive, because it is distance, it is always positive, that means this column right here is going to be positive, okay, and its value is just going to be what it is, okay, so our example, we have 96 degrees, that's 96, the opposite's negative 96, and the absolute value then is the positive representation, it's positive 96. 13 degrees below zero, below zero tells us it's going to be negative 13. Okay, the opposite of that is a positive 13. Okay, and you don't actually have to put the little plus there, but why not? And then the, ab the absolute value of positive 13 is well, positive 13. Earned twenty dollars. Okay. Earned is adding to your money, so we have positive twenty. 
The opposite is negative 20. And its absolute value is going to be the positive 20, the positive value of that. 50 feet below 0. Below will make it a negative 50. The opposite of that is positive 50. And then the absolute value is really which one of these is positive, so 50. Because when you're 50 feet below 0, you are 50 feet from the surface. From z That's the 0 there. You're 50 feet from the surface. All right, 10 yards gained on the field. Okay, you're gaining it, so it's going to be positive 10 yards. The opposite would be losing 10 yards, or, or minus. And then the absolute value is positive 10. Last couple, bank deposit of $500. Okay, a deposit means you're adding to your money. When you take a check and you deposit it, you're putting money in. So you, this is a gain of $500. The opposite would be debiting or taking out, withdrawing $500. And then the absolute value of that is positive $500. Okay, next we have a debit. Okay, debit cards are used to withdraw money. They pull it out of the bank. Um, in some way or form or fashion. So this is actually a negative. We're taking money out, $48. Opposite of that is positive 48. And the absolute value is 48. Okay, the last one here, we've got a five-yard penalty. A penalty is you are losing. It's the opposite of us gaining ground, like I remember four. So that is a penalty. We're losing five yards. The opposite will be gaining five yards, or plus. And then the absolute value is just going to be 5. Okay, next. Okay, we're going to do some operations with these. Okay, on the wall outside Latoya's house is a Celsius thermometer marked with 5 degree intervals. 5 degree intervals. Latoya saw the temperature last night was negative 5 degrees Celsius. That's where it starts. It rose 15 degrees during the day but it dropped 10 degrees in the evening. Write an expression to show what's happening with the temperature. And what is it in the evening? Okay, so first, it starts out at negative 5. Okay. If this rises, it rose 15 degrees, that means we are adding 15. And then it dropped, but it dropped 10 degrees, so it's going to be minus 10. Okay. So there's our expression, our expression that shows that what's happening with it. But let's look over here at the thermometer we've actually got. We start at negative 5. That would be between these right here. Okay. Start right there. Then we're told it rises 15. They're in 5 degree intervals, so it's 5, 10, 15. So it ends up right here. Okay, at 10. And then it drops 10 degrees. So we go 1 to 5, 10. And it ends up right here at 0 degrees. So this is 0 and so our, our expression then, so there's our expression for it, but our value is zero degrees Celsius. The units are important there. Okay. Let's look at number nine. All right, an iceberg extends 75 feet above the sea. The bottom of the iceberg is at an elevation of two, negative 247 feet. Okay, so let me label this. First, it's 75 feet above, and then the bottom down here is at negative 247 feet. So that means the distance from here to here, the bottom there, is 247. What is the height of the iceberg? So we want to know what the total is here. All right, so what we can do, we know it's 75 feet here, 247 total right there. So we're going to have to do 75 plus 247 which does happen to be 322 feet. Okay, feet because it is height. How high is it? Okay, so 322 feet. Okay, we want number 10. Okay, a similar problem. An emperor penguin stands on an iceberg that extends 10 feet above the water. Then the penguin, so well, let's see, he starts out, starts out 10 feet with the water. Then the penguin dives to an elevation of negative 67 feet to catch a fish. What's the total length of the dive? Okay, so first thing I want to do is draw out an iceberg. Kind of looks like a snow cone, but an iceberg. And the penguin starts out, and I can't draw this real great, so 
I'm just going to draw a stick figure there. But the penguin starts out 10 feet above the water. And then there's a fish, they say, that's down here. I'm going to put him at the bottom of the iceberg. A fish that's down here at negative 67 feet. So how far it is is 67 feet. Because he's down here at negative 67. Okay, so what's the length of his dive? He goes from here, whee, all the way down to here. So he goes a total of 10 plus 67 feet, which is 77 in our units feet. All right, number 11, the town's Heritage Society has decided to plant a rose garden next to the historic train depot they have just restored. A landscape architecture is drawing a plan for a rectangular rose garden, that would be this right here, on centimeter grid paper. He makes the following scale drawing, where length is 24 centimeters, there's our length, and the width is 15 centimeters, to represent the actual rose garden. Three centimeters on grid paper, three centimeters on the grid paper, represents seven meters in the actual rose garden. Now we want to find what the actual sizes are. Okay, we want to find the actual length and the actual width. Okay, now I'm going to try to come up with a process right here. They'll do that. We can use both times. Okay, so first we know that these things are measured in centimeters, right? Okay, now what we really want to do is we want to get rid of that centimeter unit, right? Get rid of the centimeters and we want to end up with meters because that's going to be the actual garden is, is in meters. So what we have to do and then I'm going to use something called dimensional analysis, okay? It's actually something that's using chemistry and in science a lot, where we want to get rid of the units. We want to get rid of centimeters and end up with meters. You with me? Hopefully so. Okay, so we are going to have, let's see here, three centimeters on grid paper represents seven meters. So three centimeters on the paper represents seven meters in the actual garden. So what it comes down to is that we can multiply we can multiply the length, which is 24 centimeters, okay, by 7 meters over 3 centimeters. Okay, we multiply this out, and this will actually, one, cancel out centimeters, cancel out the centimeters, and leave us with meters, so our answer is actually in meters, and it will give us the actual length, so 24 times 7 divided by 3, or, let's see, that's 8, that's 56. That's what it should be, 56 meters. Okay, we'll do the same process for the next one. Let's see, the, the width is 15 centimeters. Now notice, I'm writing all of my units in here because I want to make sure the units do cancel out. Because if I mess something up, that's the only way I'm going to know. All right, so this will, first off, be meters. And next, that's going to be 35, 35 meters. Okay, now one thing that I want to point out here is reasonableness. Okay, in the beginning, the length is longer than the width, correct? Okay, so is our end length longer than our width? Yes. Okay, so that means this at least sort of makes sense. Now, we could have messed something up somewhere, but this at least sort of makes sense. Okay, we want to always make sure of that. Okay, next page. Number 12, a hot air balloon is taken for a 2.5 hour trip. Now, I'm actually going to use my highlighter here. 2.5 hour trip. And I want to make sure you can read that. Two and a half hour trip. The wind speed and the speed of the balloon is 4.75 miles per hour. The balloon travels in a straight line. How many miles away from the liftoff site will the balloon land? Okay, so first off, this is actually going to come back to, I say first, this is actually going to come back to uh, the dimensional analysis, canceling, canceling out units. So what 4.75 miles per hour means is in one hour, 4.75 miles will be traveled. Okay, so I'm going to write this this way. I know I have two and a half hours. Okay, two and a half miles. Two and a half hours. Okay, I want to get rid of my hours and end up with miles, because they want to know how how many miles. Well, in one hour, we go 4.75 miles. 
So if we multiply this out, one, one thing will happen. We'll, keep, we'll lose hours and we will end up with miles. And two, well, that'll give us an, a number there. And now let's see, I don't know what this ends up being, so let's see. That's going to be 2.5 times 4.75. That is 11.875. 11.875. Eight seven five. Now they don't tell us to round this in any way, so eleven point eight seven five miles is our answer. All right, number thirteen. An underwater exploration team is swimming at a depth of negative fifteen feet. It'd be a good time to use my highlighter. Okay, negative fifteen feet. Then they dive to an underwater cave that is eight times that depth. What's the depth of the underwater cave? Well, they start at negative fifteen feet. And they go eight times. That literally is going to mean times eight. And so we should get negative 100 and 120, negative 120. And that is feet. And again, that is that is a lot deeper. I mean, that's below the surface. So that, some, that makes sense. Okay. Now, third thing we're going to be talking about in this in the in this notes are properties, some properties of integers. Okay, so we've actually only got three properties that it really comes down to use. The commutative property. Okay, now what the commutative property is, and I pointed this out earlier, is that when you add numbers, you can switch it around. So if A is 3, okay, try to imagine anytime you see a letter that it's a number. You just don't know what it is sometimes. 3 plus 2, that would be the same thing as 2 plus 3. Right? That's 5, that's 5. If you have 3 times 2, that's 6. That's the same thing as 2 times 3, which is 6. Okay, so you can change the order. Now, I'm going to kind of, all of these mean that something changes. Okay, the commutative property means the order changes. You can change the order around with multiplication or addition. You can't do a subtraction, right? 3 minus 2, 2 minus 3, one's negative, one's positive, and things go wrong real fast. Okay, you can't do that with division either. Okay, just come up with pick numbers and see if you can change it with the order when you do it. Okay, so if we see anything that says that we see where the order changes, that's gonna, we're going to know that's that property. All right, the associative property, oh, I meant to say this, commute, the root word here is commute. And if you commute to school or you commute to work or you commute to the grocery store, that means you move. You go from one place to the other. So all of you commute to school. None of you live here, I hope. I certainly commute to work. Okay, to the school as well, because I, I don't live there. I'm, I have to move and go there. So numbers like to move around, and they can with addition or multiplication. All right, next we have the associative property. Now, the root word here is associate. Okay, that's like who you group, who you group with, who you hang out with. Okay, numbers are real nice. They like to hang out with everybody. Okay, so the one thing that you need to notice here is the parentheses. Okay, so the way that these are grouped, we have A and B are grouped. But on the right side of our equation, B and C are grouped. See that? They like to hang out with different people. There we go. That's better. Okay, so if you see the grouping has changed. So here, A times B, they like to they can group together over here, but over here, B times C. Okay, so what changes here is the grouping. Oftentimes it is it is um, parentheses. But it could be brackets, it could be a square root, it could be, it could be some other things. Okay, you might see that, but it's grouping symbols. 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to be parentheses. Okay, and actually I lied, square roots wouldn't work, but brackets would, and things like that. Okay, now the third property we might have is the distributive property. Okay, now one thing to point out here is, the, is that the parentheses on one side of our equation, we actually have parentheses on the other side, we don't. Okay, so sometimes our parentheses just, this is the only way you can get rid of them sometimes. Most of the time it is. Um, but what, what happens is you can take A times B, A times B, and then A times C. So this number, the A, gets spread out. And that's the way that I often like to think of that. Um, the, a number is spread out. Okay? So it starts in one place, ends up in another. So, for instance, if I had a bucket of candy... I kind of wish I had one right now because that would be really good. But if I had a bucket of candy and I distribute that to you guys as a class, um, then what I'm doing is I'm taking, well, let's say that I give, give it all to somebody on the front row. Everybody on the front row gets candy and nobody else does. Is that distributing? Not really. It's very poor distributing. 
okay? The best thing would be to take some and give it to everyone, right? Everyone has an equal amount. I spread it out. That's exactly what happens here. The numbers just get spread out. Um, now, that's also where, actually, if you notice, it works with subtraction. A times B minus A times C, that works there too. Um, and I'll point out here in just a second, you can actually do something called right distribution. And we'll see that in just a second. Okay, so let's go through these. And first, we're going to look for a, an order change. Okay, so if you see, like, for instance, 7, then 7 plus 8, and then 8 plus 7, the order has changed, right? 7, 8, 8, 7. Okay, this one is the commutative property. And if you can't read my writing once I write this, look back up there. They're all written. All right, so that you can spell them, right? You're never going to have to, I'm never going to give you a spelling test on these. So as long as I can tell what you're saying is right, but they're almost always going to be on your test or your homework or whatever, so you can always see it there. Okay, so the commutative property. I'm going to keep looking for things where the order changes as good examples. Okay, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8. Not exactly. Okay, the, the order, it's kind of weird. We have different numbers. Okay, so we'll come back to that one. 6, 9, 7. 6, 9, 7. Order did not change. 7, 3, 5. 7, 3, 5. Order is all good. 6, 2, 5. 2, 5, 6. That one, the order changed. That one right there. So commutative property for this one as well. Okay. Commutative. Okay. 5, 3, 2. 3, 5, 2. Commutative there as well. If I can write it. Okay. If you're watching this video at home, then by all means, fast forward this so that you can just see the end result. Commutative. Okay, and then our last one there, 1, 4, 15, 15, and 60. No order change there. Okay, so we have numbers 14, numbers 18, and numbers 19 are commutative. Commutative. Okay, so next we want to look for grouping. Okay, did any grouping change? Meaning parentheses kind of move around. Different things are grouped with different things. Okay, so the ones that look really obvious to me are 16, 6, 9, 6 and 9 are grouped together, and over here, 9 and 7 are grouped together. So this is the associative property. Okay, i got to fix that. Okay, there, and associative. I don't know why this thing doesn't like me writing on this. Okay, associative. Now, let's see if anything was with the parentheses change. Here, 3 and 5 are grouped together, and over here, 7 and 3. So that's the associative property as well. Associative property. And I believe that's it. Okay, now the last one is where I say the numbers are spread out. Here we go. 2 times 3. That, that's 6. 2 times 4, that's 8. That would classify as the distributive property. Okay. You get the point. Distributive property. Okay, and last, this is actually where we have right distribution. We have 15 times 1 is 15. 15 times 4 is 60. Okay, the 15 gets spread around. So, distribution. I'm going to figure this out when I'm done with this. Why this is lagging so bad. Distribute. Distributive property. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's notes. Okay, just as a recap, we had integers, how we do that on the number line, we have absolute value, where that's always, always positive, and then those properties we just talked about. All right.